Okay, it would look like I am live. Hello, Rainbow Warriors, and welcome to another edition of Wednesdays with Mr. Tie-Dye. This looks like it's my 13th episode. So last week I had made some changes to the format, and I think that went really well, so we're going to continue on with that. So basically... Oh, okay. Well, I think the... The other people can still hear me. So we're going to hold on for just a second here. Looks like uh, I guess there's commercials rolling. Thank you. Let me know when it's done. Okay, hello and welcome to Wednesdays with Mr. Tie-Dye. Hello to all the Rainbow Warriors out there. So this is my 13th episode. Uh, last week I made some changes to the format of the show and that seemed to run really smoothly. I've had a lot of good feedback from that. So we're going to just continue on with that. I'm basically going to do uh, one tapestry. I'm going to tie the whole thing up. Uh, I'll ask that you hold your questions unless they are, uh, have to do with the tapestry that I'm tying. Hold all your questions till the end. Uh, after I've tied and dyed the tapestry, then I'll put it in my bin, clean up the table, and then I'll do the auction real quick. We have the DNA diamond tap that I tied last week. And once I'm done with that, then I'll do question and answer for a little bit. So first off, I want to make some announcements here so we've had some new members uh looks like we had Teresa sign up just now during this video here while she was waiting and we also had Relly and Leticia sign up as new members and in this last week I've had two donations and the interesting thing is they're both Deborah's one is spelled with an H at the end but thank you to Deborah and Deborah for your donations all the support my channel receives is very much appreciated Okay, so let's just jump right into the tapestry here. So what I'm starting with is a tapestry. Oh, I guess let me do some shout outs. Sorry. Okay, let's see who we got in the house today. Well, of course, we have Julie in the house. Uh, Saucy Mare, Jenny, Louise, Uniquely Yours, Alan, Jewel, Annie, Tide-Eyed. Uh, let's see. Jasmine, Donald, Vicky, Eric, Dodja. My mom's in the house. Hello, mom. Nice to see you. Or have you seen me? Uh, Michelle, Asia, Betsy. Uh, I can't quite read that. It looks like Limpy. Uh, Lori, Jenny. Okay, hello everybody. So welcome to the 13th episode of Wednesdays with Mr. Tie-Dye. So today I'm going to do a Mandela tapestry. And what I'm starting with is a tapestry that's been soaked in soda ash. I spun it out so that it was barely damp. But then also since I, the number of folds that I'm going to have in here, uh, I went ahead and hung this up to dry. So it's, it's not quite completely dry, but it, this is mostly dry right now. So I might need to spritz it with a little soda ash when it comes to dyeing this. So I folded the tapestry in half and then I folded it in quarters so that I could find my exact center line. That's where we're going to start the Mandela at. So the way that I'm going to do this one, you could just do airplane folds, but I like doing the pleated folds basically. So what I'm going to do is draw two 60 degree angles on here. And then I'll fold this line up to here so that it's going to make it a 30 degree angle. Anyways, you'll see what I'm doing here. And then we're going to tie up a nice mandela on here. And this is something I, I love mandelas because they're so versatile about what you can do with them. 
Each little change that you make changes the whole outcome of your Mandela. So basically I'm lining my flat edge up here on the bottom and then this here is a 60 degree angle that I'm drawing up here. So you could use a protractor and just draw two 60 degree lines. I'm gonna extend these out a little bit with my yardstick. Oh, somebody said that when I do shout outs, it reminds them of their favorite show, uh, Romper Room. Yes, I can remember watching that when I was a kid. Yeah, we got to do a little bit of shout outs to everybody that's in the house. I appreciate you guys showing up and hanging out with me. Looks like we have 68 people watching right now. Or at least that's what mine says. I know sometimes mine doesn't always update all the way. Oh, also I'm trying out a new mic. And since nobody's complained they can't hear me, I'm guessing that everybody can hear me with the new mic. The only problem is I can't plug my phone in to charge, so I'll have to check it later. Maybe during the Q&A session, I'll bring the camera down closer and plug the phone back in. Okay, so we got my two 60 degree lines drawn up here. So what I'm gonna do now is take this edge here. So what I folded the tapestry in half. So this here is the center line of the tapestry. This is the exact middle of the tapestry. So I'm gonna fold one of these lines here, the center, and line it up right here. So I'm just pinching right at the center and just lining that right up on the line there. And then just kind of smooth that out as much as you can. I like to just kind of smooth it down nice and flat and then that way I can kind of reach underneath here, pinch that outer edge up, pick up the center line and flip this line underneath. So, and then at this point, what I'm doing is just lining up the fold right with the other fold here. So I'm just lining those up right on top of each other. Yeah, I just need to have a bigger table here so I can do these better. One day we're gonna get into a studio, and that's gonna be nice. Okay, so now I'm gonna take this line and I'm gonna line it up over here on this one. So it's just about lining your creases up here, get them nice and even. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of working to get them lined up perfectly straight. Sometimes I'm a little bit off, but the nice thing with the Mandela is if you're just a slight bit off, it's not really that noticeable, so. And then once again, I'm gonna pinch the center and up here at the top, pick this up and flip it under. And that's just what works the best for me. If you find a, a different way that works better for you, then that's great. Really, I just try to show you how I do it, and hopefully that will inspire you to either figure out how it works best for you, or if you can take my method and improve on it that makes it better for you, that's great too. Okay, once I get it all folded up, then I just try to smooth out all my edges up here at the top. And usually I'll just kind of fold that down a little bit just so I can put the whole thing on my table here. And we'll line this up. And basically what I'm going to do now is draw a little line here. I'm going to do uh, several different things on here. I'm going to start out with a Ron star here in the middle for a couple folds. So I'm just going to kind of guesstimate how much fabric I want for that. So I'm going to do a couple folds down here, Ron star. And then I'm going to put a couple orb, oval orb shapes in here. So basically I'm just drawing on my fold lines of how I want to design this. And the nice thing about mandelas is you can test them out ahead of time. So I will show you how you test them in just a second here. Now I'm going to do a star shape on here. So since I folded this into sixths, this is going to give me six points here. But then the other thing you can do 
Here's the outer edge of my tapestry. So what I'm going to do is draw a line down here. I'm just going a couple of fingers down so that my star shape is all the way on the tapestry. And I'm just going to go to about the middle of the line here of my tapestry. And then draw the same thing on this other side. So now this one here going up just one way is going to give me six points. This here is going to give me 12 points because this here is six and this here is six. So that's the, going to be the tapestry that I fold up. And like I say, if you want to test it out ahead of time to kind of have an idea of what you're folding, what I did here, I didn't, I can't fold the, the Ron star in, but I left a little space here. I did a little cutout, a little cutout, so I did these two. I cut in for this one here, and then I cut in for this one here. So now this here is basically the same thing as what I'm folding up here. So this is, I can get a sneak preview of what my tapestry is going to look like. So this is a fun way to test out your Mandela's ahead of time. So, and I'm not sure just how well you can see it, but here's my points for my stars here, and then the other points, and then these are the two cutouts that I did. I did one big one and one small one. Same thing on here. So that's what we're going to now fold up and tie-dye. So what I'm gonna do is start with sinew over here. So for the Ron star, I'm going to use sinew. For the rest of this, I'm going to tie it up with kite string. And I'm not... Let's see here. How different is that from the airplane fold? Uh, the airplane fold puts your creases on the inside. And this here, I have access to all of my creases. So that's another thing you can do if you want to modify... <clears throat> your tapestry or if you have a more intricate fold that you want to put on here so you want to do some heart shapes on here you could lift up just that one layer fold your heart shape in fold that back lift up this layer tie another set of hearts in fold that back where if you do the airplane fold uh, usually most of your your creases are stuffed down inside also I like this here because if need be sometimes I can open some of these up later and squirt dye down inside but on an airplane fold, you might have one big fat, fat crease on one side and a couple smaller ones on the other side. So that's the reason that I like to fold them up this way. Like I said, I do them both ways, but today I prefer this way. So that's what we're doing. So let's see. Yep, we're going to do the bidding after I'm done with this. So I separated out the, the format of this show because it was just a little confusing, I think, for the people watching afterwards. Uh, this way, the whole tie-dye demonstration is at the beginning of the video, and then the auction in the middle, and then at the end is the Q&A. So basically, I'm doing my the Ron Star fold. So I'm taking my point and flipping that over, and then I'm going to run my sinew right along here. And wrap that around a few times. Pull that tight. I usually will wrap it a couple more times and pull it tight. Uh, could uh, T be folded the same way you did tapestry? Yes. Yes, you can. Okay, so there's my first Ron Star. And now I'm going to fold it the other way here. And wrap up one more time. So I'm just going to do just a couple of the Ron stars just to give me a little bit of a star shape in the middle. So I wrap a couple times, tighten it. Well, I might have... Yeah, I think I did that backwards. Oh well, it'll still work. Okay, so there's the two Ron stars in the middle. Now the rest of this I'm going to tie up with kite string. So I'm going to go ahead and just do a pleated fold along here. And 
And the main thing is just keeping getting all your creases. So I'm reaching underneath to grab just to make sure that I'm getting all my creases folded in there. You don't want to lose your creases or your orbs are going to be not all even. <clears throat> With this tapestry being completely dry, it's just a little bit harder to fold, but it's going to allow me to dye this dry, which with all the layers of fabric is what I wanted to do. But doing a live show, I couldn't let it sit and dry for a couple days after I tied it. So, But with these little short runs, it's easy to tie these up. Like I say, I'm just using the kite string. I just want this tied tight enough to hold it. I'm not trying to create the, the white lines with this one here. Oh, it looks like... Where did I just saw that comment slide up here? So Sky said, "I've been practicing mandalas lately. How cool is it that you're making a mandala on my birthday?" Yes, the, the I made this decision last week. It just came to me in one of my meditations when I was thinking about the tapestry, and mandala is what kept coming to me. So I put it down. So happy birthday, Sky, and thank you for hanging out on Wednesday afternoon of your birthday with me. Now we're tying this other one, and since I have the I had the two orbs kind of overlapping in the space here, just a little bit tight folding this. So, but you just have to to work at it, and you can get it to to lay in there how you want it. And it just crinkles some of this middle part up, but that will be good because the dye will flow differently right there and add some texture to your tapestry. I love creating texture and movement within the tie dye. That's what I love about the liquid dyes. Whether well, whether you're doing liquid or ice dyes, ice dyes you get even more of that motion. But working with those compared to like paint, paint isn't quite the same thing. I guess unless you're doing a pour, but the liquid, the way that it moves through the fabric, just really creates the movement visually. And that's what I really love about tie-dye. Plus, they're all unique. Because every one of us is unique. So to have an art form that emphasizes the uniqueness is wonderful. Okay, so we got that one tied here. Like I say, these are just a little bit more difficult to tie up when they're dry. They don't want to kind of fold together quite as easily. So I'm going to wrap to this other side a little bit just to try to lock that in a little bit because I don't have my line quite straight on here. It's a little bit crooked. Oop, almost buckled it. So in this way I'm kind of locking these two together to create support for each of them. So and then I just kind of crease up I'm crinkling up this center part here that was above the the Ron star that I tied just to get that crinkled and fashioned in here so now I'm just kind of wrapping all of these together in just one form or another to get a little bit of support going there okay now I'm gonna leave my string tied Oh, it looks like we have another new member. Donna, welcome to the Mr. Tie-Dye membership. Thank you for your support. I certainly appreciate all the support from all the fans out there. It does help me continue making these videos. Right now, I, ha I do have a bunch of custom orders that I'm finishing up, but I'm not going to be doing too many custom orders because on top of doing these videos, I also have some of my own projects that I want to do. And life has just gotten busy, so uh, since I'm cutting custom orders out, it's nice to have the support through the video channel. Okay, so there's my one straight line that I folded or drew up there. So we're just about ready to start throwing some dye on. I'm going to do this last fold here, and then we're going to break some dye out. 
So, anyways, thank you, Donna, and welcome to the Mr. Tie-Dye membership site. Okay, so now this one I'm going to wrap it back down and tie it off now. Let's see, Asia, let's see. Oh, where did I see that? Oh, we got some more new members. So Shelly, or Shelby, just signed up, and Tie-Dye just signed up, signed up. So thank you both for your support. I appreciate it, welcome. And hugs out to everybody. So how's everybody doing today? We have kind of a cloudy day here in Oregon. Temperature's still decent, but a little bit cloudy and overcast out there. Okay, so now I, like I say, I tied up the Ron Star, and then I did my two orbs. I did my one line going up, and now I have, and this here is gonna create six points. This last one here is gonna create 12 points here. So we're gonna fold that last one up. And the other thing is just making sure that all your layers are still here on both sides as you're going. Okay, let's see what we got going here. Warm here, but humidity is gone for now. 97 degrees near me, it feels like 109. Oh, wow. Yeah, I can, I, I can handle when it gets up into the 90s, but I don't like it to stay there. My, my favorite is right around 80, which is comfortable weather for wearing shorts and tank tops going barefoot although I can handle the the heat a little better than I can the cold but yeah when it starts getting up into the high 90s and the hundreds that's a little harder to take Ooh, 112 here in Tucson yeah that's Arizona for you 74 and partly cloudy in Ohio Okay, so I'm doing my run here, and I always like my the end of my run to be on the downward side, and this one here happens to be on the upward side. So I'm going to just back up a couple folds and just make a couple of those a little bit shorter so that I can adjust my where my fold, my downline comes out here. So there, now the, the end of this run here is on the downward side here, and that just means I can take this other line here, flip it up and over, and line it up right here. So let's see, 80 and sunny in o o uh, <laughs> Iowa? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, let's see, humidity is horrible in Louisiana. Yeah, the humidity. What? Yep, we wished her a happy birthday earlier. Yeah, Julie's just lagging behind in the birthdays. But happy birthday, Sky. Okay, so I just got that fold up and around there. It does kind of bunch up here. We'll get that flattened down a little bit after I get the whole thing tied. I still need to get that lined up if I can get it squeezed over a little more. Yeah, that's the one thing about folding them dry is just a little bit harder to manhandle and move them around because everything just wants to unfold on you. But dry is going to definitely help me when it comes to putting the dies on. Let's see. 27 degrees Celsius in the UK. Uh, I'm not up on the, all of the translations, but I believe that would be quite warm over there too. 94 but feels like 105 here in Florida. <laughs> yeah, probably your humidity. Uh, okay, so I'm just about done here. I didn't get my line quite as straight as I wanted here, but I can, when I put my dies on, I'll just die in that little bit of an arc there. So we'll get this tied, and then I'm going to flatten that down a little bit here. Okay. 
89 in Pendleton. That's where my, my parents and the rest of my family live is in Pendleton. They get some quite hot weather in the summertime as well as some quite cold weather in the wintertime. And then those spring days you can have 60 or 70 degree change from the morning to the afternoon. So Pendleton can be quite extreme. Well, I'm sure all, all places can be extreme in one way or another, but I didn't leave, uh, live in all places. Why use kite string instead of sinew at this point? Because uh, I'm not wanting the, the, the white lines. I'm wanting just to do the more colored. I did use the sinew up here for the Ronstar because I want some white lines. But the rest of this here, I don't want it tied quite that tight. Uh, I do go back and forth. So this here just happens to be my personal preference today. Uh, if I did this tapestry tomorrow, maybe I would go with the sinew, but yep, that's just a, another option there. Whether you use sinew or kite string at this point or even rubber bands. Okay, so now I'm just flattening the rest of this out here and just trying to put some creases in there where I can. And I left my string attached so that I can wrap that up. Made my grandkids two shirts. They loved them. It's hot here in Texas. Uh, Texas Heat, your shirts are beautiful. Thank you. Oh, thank you, and you're welcome. Yep, I love having, helping people have success with this art. I've been playing and practicing with this art for 20 years, and it can be quite tricky to get started into. So I share so that more people can have success. Um, oh, I. <laughs> Saucy, you asked me if I have new glasses. No, these glasses are the same, but the reason I'm laughing is because uh, I think two days ago I went and had my eye exam and I ordered new glasses. So in the next week or so I will be getting new glasses. But these are the same ones that I've had. If I, you see me squinting, it's usually because they're sliding down on my nose and I squint to try to push them back up. I know it always makes, it makes me look like I'm making funny faces, but... Red is, what is a Ron Star? Uh, it's a technique that was developed by uh, Ron Davis. He's a tie-dye artist and he's been doing this for many, many years and he's taught thousands of people how to do tie-dye over the years, whether it was in person or through some videos or through chatting or whatever ron has done a bunch well anyways this was his method and it just got called the ron star method and it's basically you do an airplane fold and then you fold the the end over this here isn't quite the best thing to show you on but once you have your your point then you fold the point over and tie here and then you fold it back over the other way and tie there I do have a few different videos on the Ron Star that you can look up on my site here, and that will give you the full explanation. I just did a couple of them down here to give me a star shape down there. So now I'm using my trusty cuticle pusher to press down some of these creases in here. And yes, Saucy, I still have one. I probably need to buy a spare just in case. What is the Mandela? <laughs> A Mandela is a sacred design. It's a repeating form. Uh, by folding this up, like I say, I'm getting repeating shapes that go around in a circular pattern. And lots of different things can, can be called uh, a Mandela. The, I mean, because Mandelas are so versatile. Vers versatile. I think more versatile than my tongue is right now. Maybe I need a drink. Oh, yeah, the, I can show Asia the preview here that I, I just crumpled up a little bit. But this here is basically what I folded up. 
So I did the Ron Star down here in the middle, which is not shown. I folded up these two points here, and then I did one straight line, which will give me six points down here. And then this part here I did uh, down in two ways, so it's going to give me 12 points around the outer edge. But that's basically what we have folded up here, and then we're going to dye that. So, thank you. Saucy for keeping me on track with that. Uh, best thing. <laughs> okay, let me take a quick peek what we got going on here. 86, low humidity in Virginia. Mandela is awesome. Okay, so now I'm going to start tying this. And this is when I'm going to put a towel underneath it just to try to catch any of my drips, but also to help soak up, soak the, the dye down through. And we're going to, well, let me spray this first. Since this here is dry, I'm going to sp spritz this with a little bit of soda ash just to help break the, the surface tension. Uh, sometimes when the dry fabric is dry and you put dye on, it wants to roll off. So putting some soda ash on to the Mandela will help break that surface tension. So I just give it a quick spray all the way around. And then you can put more on later if you need to. But. And then by laying this on this towel, I'm going to dye just from the top to start with. And I'll wait until like in these thicker parts of my tapestry that I see color coming through to the bottom before I actually start, uh, before I flip it over and dye from the other side. So let's get some gloves on and then we'll start putting some dye on here. Okay, I seen somebody's red, white, and blue shirt failed miserably and want to know what kind of dye. I use Procyon dyes and they're fiber reactive dyes. I buy most of them from Dharma. But these are the ones, uh, they, they will mix if you put them on top of each other, but you have much better luck without putting uh, the dyes right on top of each other. And I know with the some of them out there, they tend to spread more than others. Oh, uniquely yours. Thank you for your donation. Uh, let's see. Thanks for doing this stream for us, Carl. You're welcome. And like I say, I appreciate the support. So what I'm going to do to start with is I'm dyeing my Ron Star up here. Just I, My plan is to have a, a white star there in the blue field. So I'm just dyeing the whole blue field. Uh, turquoise and then I'm going to dye my two little orbs in different colors here and like I say I'm dying just from the top to start with just to make sure that my dye goes down through all of the layers of the fabric so I'm just going through and putting my first coat on and then I'll come back and add another coat and then we'll just keep checking along the bottom to see how it's coming along. Okay, so I use turquoise down here, fuchsia, and lemon yellow, and now I'm going to use emerald green here in the middle. And none of these dyes are thickened. They're all just regular dyes. 
when you're doing multiple layers like this, you want to make sure that your dies can spread down inside there. So, and then I'm going to die right up to my line. This is the line that I folded right here. <clears throat> so I'm dying right up to that. So this here is going to put me with the, the green star points coming up from there, from the bottom here. And this hair area is thicker, so I'm just kind of adding more dye and just letting it soak down inside there. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay, looks like I answered Mary's question. That's great. <clears throat> Let's see. Capricorn twins, the sides are French braided in the braid. Oh, yep. Uh, my lady braids this for me every day. She does a cornrow braid down both sides and then brings them all together right under my chin. So that gets it back out of my way. Oh, thank you, Annie. I appreciate the support. You're welcome. And thank you. Okay, let's go back here. That takes talent. Yes, she's been practicing this for a while. We worked on it for several months before we kind of figured out just how I liked it the best. So I tried doing uh, double braids coming down and three braids coming down and all different fashions, but this here is what we finally settled on, or I settled on, that I liked the best. But yes, in the summertime, she braids this up for me and gets it up off my chest, but also she likes it because she can see my face. Same with my mom. Hello, mom. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, that would be... <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay. I gave myself a quarantine haircut. That was a mistake. Do you ever use urea when mixing your dye? Yes, I do sometimes. Not all the all of the time, but in colors like um, my black, my red, and I think a couple of my blues. Any ones that I use extra dye in, I'll usually put the urea in because the urea helps you blend up more powder into the liquid. So, oh, Lisa, welcome to Mr. Tie-Dye Membership. Thank you for signing up to be a fan. I appreciate the support. Namaste. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's go ahead and get going here. Um... Trying to decide what color I want to do this and what color I'm doing for the outside. So I didn't plan this out ahead of time. Sorry. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, let's, let's do purple here. And then I think we're going to do the outside in turquoise and sapphire blue. So we're going to put purple on. This here is going to be my 12 points around the whole mandala. And I think maybe, no, we'll just do the whole thing. If that was more even, I might have dyed that a different color, but the, I can see I kind of scrunched it up weird, so... Okay, well, we're getting some good color put on here. And just a matter of getting it to soak in. So I just keep applying more layers. And I'll come back and add more layers and then we'll check the bottom. Oh, yeah, if somebody's asking questions. I appreciate you guys letting them know. We changed the format a little bit. Uh, I'm answering questions about the, the tapestry here, and sometimes I'll see one, and I'll just answer it. But 
I'm going to do the Q&A session at the end just to kind of keep the whole tutorial more congruent for people watching afterwards. It was just a little bit confusing to sign in and the tapestry sometimes would take an hour and a half to tie because I kept interrupting it with other things. So we're just trying to streamline this a little bit also to shorten my, my length because I was running into three hour videos and that could be a long time to be sitting here or out there. Okay. So it's just a matter of just continuing to soak more dye on here. And I can, as I'm putting it on, I can just kind of watch it sink in. I can see the color shift in there. It gets lighter after I've added the dye. And that just means that it's soaked in the deeper layers of the fabric. And that's what I can see here with this green. That's another color I can see easily. Let's see. <laughs> Who are you poking, Saucy? How much ounces is your little bottles? These here hold four ounces. They have a nice metal tip on them. And I found these on Amazon. I don't have the link here, but in quite a few of my videos where I use the bottles, there is a link to this here. And it's something you can ask me later if I've forgotten. And I will put a link in the description of this video for these little bottles. But I found them on Amazon. I think they're Benacrit, Benacrit, something like that. But they're four ounce, uh, they call them glue bottles. So you might be able to find them just through searching that. But yeah, four ounces is a nice amount compared to these other ones. I think these were two ounce bottles from Dharma. Okay. So I'm just going along and just adding more of each of the colors on here and just letting them soak in. After this round, I think I'll lift it up and see what the bottom's looking like. Uh, let's see. Mine's having a party without me. <laughs> Is that your hair having a party? Uh, tutorial spider. Hello, Rainbow Warriors. Hi, Pam. Nice to see you. I need a bigger bottle. Yeah, I, I, these bottles, I've been using these ones here. Uh, somebody said they just bought them and used them and they didn't leak. I've been using them for over a year and I haven't had any leaks with them at all. They can be just slightly tricky to fill, and that's why I put a, a little video up on how I fill the bottles. Basically, you're just filling them with a bigger bottle. I stick this in, seat it in there, create a vacuum, and then I just fill it right up. Let's see. Um, yeah, you can message me. Somebody's uh, Karina is asking for advice. Let me... That's my launch links. If you scroll down, if you click on that, scroll down to the bottom, there's a couple ways that you can contact me, either through my store or through uh, my couple Facebook pages. And that's the, the easiest way to, to get a hold of me. And you can ask questions, and I go in and try to answer them at least a few times a week. Sometimes they might slide by me for a few days when life gets busy, but I do try to go in and answer questions around all of my platforms at least a few times a week. <laughs> yes, hair's having a party. Actually, it has seven colors in it, so it's like having a tie-dye party. Awesome! I love to see color in people's hair, although I don't have any in mine, but... It is fun to see it. Uh, my, let's see, I guess it would be my nephew-in-law. It would be my niece's husband. He recently dyed his hair green, and it just looks awesome. I love it. Okay, I think I'm going to lift this up and take a peek here. See what this is looking like. Uh, 
Okay, so I can see just a little bit of the turquoise soaking through here. I'm going to dye, put more dye on. I want to see more in these thicker areas. And I can start to see a little bit of purple here. So I'm going to add more purple. My green is looking pretty good. And I think I'll add a little bit more fuchsia, but my yellow and my turquoise up here are looking good. So this here is kind of how I like to see it on the bottom before I start adding dye there. So like I say, these three areas, I'm going to add more dye to the top before I actually flip it over. Oh, we got over a hundred people watching. Nice. I think I, I had gone over a hundred last week, so I think this Wednesday show is growing. Let's see. Oh, and thank you, Saucy, for recommending everybody like the video. If you're if you're liking it, you might have to exit out of the chat to like it, but that's much appreciated. And I know YouTube has their algorithms and stuff. And when my videos have more likes on them, then I believe they're easier to find. And also in the search results, then when people are searching for something, if my videos are getting a lot of likes, then they will start putting those up towards the top. So I appreciate you guys liking the videos. The other thing that you can do to support my channel that doesn't cost you anything but a little bit of time is to let the ads roll. By letting the ads roll, Google is paying YouTube for those ads that run on the videos. And every time you guys let an ad roll, I get a little piece of that advertising money. So basically YouTube is sharing it with me. So letting those run helps add a little bit more income in my bank each month, and it doesn't cost you anything. So thank you, thank you. I appreciate the support in whichever way you guys choose to do it. And I'll just keep putting out these videos as long as there's interest. And it seems like there's going to be interest for a while because there's lots and lots of new people trying this art out. Oh, and I think... I better be careful because I didn't mix new turquoise dye. So I think I'm going to start putting some sapphire now on this because I want this outer edge to be two-tone. So we're going to add some sapphire blue to this outer edge here and let that start soaking in some. else we got going on <laughs> see mr. tide I please don't let I think that's supposed to say fame go to your head keep the humble guy you are yes I will stay humble I'm just starting a new little tie-dye bed is business. Any advice? Uh, yeah, I think my, my best advice is lots of practice and also start posting pictures of your work out there. As you post pictures of your work, you're going to get some feedback, but you also might start getting some sales. So that's a, a nice way. And then when craft fairs and things like that start coming back, opening up again, you might look into some of those or just look at more places to post pictures of your work. I also use Instagram, but I know there's a ton of different social media platforms. So just find the ones that you like and just kind of post your work out there. Uh, let's see. I've been watching some ads. Thank you, Saucy and Michelle. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I'm going to take another peek here and see what this is looking like. So now I can see a bunch more turquoise showing up here. That means that my layers of fabric in there are getting very well saturated. And same with my purple here. So I think all of these are looking good. So I'm going to go ahead, maybe add one more layer 
of dye of uh, my turquoise and my purple and then I'm going to go ahead and flip this over and put dye on the other side. And the other side then doesn't take quite as much dye because we've already forced it all the way through. So I'm going to add the sapphire dye out here. In fact, I'll get the bigger bottle. sell my stuff on eBay yep eBay I've I've done that before and I've also sold some stuff on Etsy and just a matter of finding the platforms that work for you uh, let's see sir nice to see your work where can I get these colors in Kolkata uh, I'm not sure if they're uh, available there or not but there I will put a link uh, but Paula Birch has a website where she lists a bunch of places that you can buy the, the dyes around the world. I buy mine here in the U.S. from Dharma, but also I bought from Custom Colors in North Carolina and Grateful Dyes in Colorado. And I've also heard about ProCam is another dye house. I know a lot of the dye houses are getting slammed with dye orders, so they're getting behind, and I've also heard of dye shortages. So that's something we might have to be patient on some of these dye houses, wait until they're able to get some of their colors restocked. We just got to have patience. It's, it's going to come back. Let's see. Where's a good place to get tapestries? I buy mine from sunshinejoy.com. Okay, so I'm going to squirt a little bit of turquoise up there, and I'm going to go ahead and put it on down here since I have it in my hand. And this is a thicker area, so I want to let this soak in a little bit before I add my sapphire on top. Oh, you used to live in Colorado, huh? Yeah, I haven't been there yet, but it is one of the places. I mean, I'd like to go to all 50 states, but I also want to travel around the world. Do you know if the dyes are toxic at all? I do a lot of dyeing in my kitchen on my dining table. Um, that's where I do mine. This is my kitchen, although this isn't my dining table. This is just my dye table, but um, I know there is some toxicity to it. I, I wear a dust mask when I'm mixing my dyes and I also try to not splash them around. You know when I'm measuring and scooping I'm trying to not splash because the dye particles once they become airborne then they can float all over the place. But I don't have a lot of information on the toxicity. You could probably go to the Dharma website and look up their MSDS sheet and get more information about that. But lots of people die uh, in their house, but there's some people that they will only die outside or in their garage or in their basement. So that's kind of a, a personal choice there. All righty. So like I say, this side here, I don't have to add as much dye because we have dye soaking through all of those layers here. So it makes dye in the second side much faster. Uh, oh, oh yeah, the quantum dyes, uh, Bo Dorsey, he also makes uh, tapestry blanks. So that's somebody you can find on Facebook at either quantum dyes or look up Bo Dorsey and you can order tapestry blanks from him 
He sews it himself to make sure to put the little loops in the corners for the hanging. And I've dyed some of his and they dye up really nicely. Uh, I think the ones I had were uh, organic cotton and hemp blend. So they were really nice tapestries. Let's see, the best platform to get followers on. Um, I, I don't really do a lot out there in social media. There's, there's way more platforms than, than I'm uh, privy to. The ones that I use, though, is YouTube, of course, uh, Facebook, and Etsy, or Instagram. I do have a Twitter account, and I, I just don't get in there very much to check it. But every now and then I, I get a notification that I've had some comments or something. So I do, I think, share stuff from Instagram over there. But as far as all the rest of the platforms, I really don't know which ones are the best. You just have to kind of explore and find which ones you like to work with because that's the whole thing. Uh, platforms, you need to keep up on them. And so, like, for me, Twitter is not one that I am really up on how to use it. So that's the my most neglected platform. But you don't want to have five or six neglected platforms. You want to have platforms that you're keeping up to date so you're followers are knowing that you are currently working on on tie-dye and selling it and stuff if they come in and you haven't posted anything in six months or so then that just kind of tells people you're not very active so my recommendation is to find platforms that you like going on and fill up those platforms because then you're more likely to keep up on them if you enjoy them that makes sense. That's my thinking anyways, my recommendation. But there's lots of different platforms and you just have to find ones that work for you and you might be able to ask other people which platforms they're on and get a better idea of which ones you might want to check out. Let's see. Uh, the auction hasn't started yet. We're going to start that in just a few minutes. I've changed the, the format of my show here. So I start out by doing the tutorial first. And once I'm done with this, then I put this aside, clean things up, and then we do the auction. And then after the auction closes, then I go into Q&A session. So that way... Later on, people can watch just which parts they want to. If somebody wants to just see the tutorial, that's all at the beginning of the video. And I usually try to put time, time stamps in so that people can find things easier. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is just squish this just a little bit. So I have my towel here on another dry section over top of the tapestry. This is just going to help push some of the dye down in there, but also soak up some of the excess dye. And that way, we don't have quite as much dye traveling around. And then you can open up and peek down in here if you want to, but if you have dyed it from the one side only and seen good dye coming through, you should have good dye saturation all the way through. And that's what I'm seeing in here. I don't see any well, I see very minimal white spots. That's not even white. It's just light colored. So I think we're all good on the tapestry. I'm going to put this away, and then we are going to get set up and do the, the auction for the diamond DNA tapestry. Or DNA diamond. Okay. So this here is going to batch for 48 hours, and then as usual, I'll do my rinse out on Friday and put a video up for that, for the reveal. So for now, I'm going to clean up. And we even finished up the tutorial once again in an hour's time so I think that's working out nicely 
I get one tutorial done in the first hour. Then we'll go right into the auction here in just a minute. So, I'm going to put a link once again. This here is my launch links. You can click on, I think it's the second link that will show you the whole tapestry here. I'm going to open it up and show as much as I can in the video. But this is the diamond DNA that we folded up last time and dyed. So... Got this nice diamond in the middle. And then we have the rainbow spirals out here on the edge. And then this here is in black and cobalt around there. But this here is the diamond DNA tapestry. So this here is officially up for auction. So you guys can place your bids just in the comment box here. In fact, I'll go ahead and leave this up while we're bidding. Let me see if I can see what's going on here before we get into the bids. You're welcome, Aaron. I'm glad that you're liking it. Let's see. Happy Christmas is the highlight of my Fridays. Yes, mine too. Okay, so we have, we got some bids. I'm going to go ahead and read them all, but we had a bid of 35, and then it jumped right to 50, and then it jumped to 90. So our high bid right now is at 90 from the Tie-Dye Magician. Uh, the size of this tapestry is 56 by 54 inches. It's a Sunshine Joy tapestry. It's sewn on two edges uh, for this one here, top and bottom, and it's got the little loops on the corners for hanging. And then the other two edges are the salvage edges, which is you know, a nice finished edge on there. So these here are really nice tapestries. I enjoy working with them. So we're sitting at $90 right now for the diamond tapestry. So let's see. I need to get a table like he has. I'm working on an old school table that teachers used. <laughs> yeah, this here is uh, one of those tables. It's almost three feet wide by six feet long and it folds in half right here. And so I bought it, I think, at Costco or something like that. Okay, this is up to 95 from Jason. So these are nice because I have a few extras. When I was going out and doing tie-dye parties, I could fold them up and stick them right in my car and take them with me. And then the, they're just a nice plastic, so they wipe down good. Okay. Okay, Emma, that, that's not fun. I put you in timeout right now. We're trying to do an auction. Okay, so Jason has the high bid. And let's see. Yeah, I'm not sure what, what that was. Somebody was just typing letters in, trying to be funny, I think. So they're in timeout. If they come back and do it again, then we'll just block them. Let's see, I'm currently sitting on a batch of shirts I just died a few hours ago. I just want to let you know you inspired me to try even though I know they may not look that great. Oh, they're going to look awesome because you dyed them. And I'm glad to be inspiration and helping you out. Okay, so Saucy Mare just bid 100 for the Diamond Tapestry. Thank you, Saucy. 
Uh, and yes, I do sign all of the tapestries. It's not signed right now. I usually wait until after I sell it and then I sign it and date it. So let's see. So Saucy has the high bid right now of 100. But yes, Austin, you just, it's tie dye is not something you can compare yourself to somebody else. You really can compare yourself only to yourself. So you tie dye some things, wash them, and see how they came out. And then the next time you tie something up, you just kind of tweak it a little bit, make some changes, and then you see how it comes out. So taking pictures of your stuff is a good way to be able to see your progress over the years. I wish I had taken pictures from the very beginning, but I didn't start taking serious pictures until about 2008. So I have a bunch of my early work that I don't have any pictures of, but that's where you can really kind of look back and see just where you have improved in your work. So I look forward to seeing your results. So if you're on Facebook, please tag me in your pictures. Okay, we got Jason bid 105 and then Mustang Xena bid 115. So we're still bidding here. I'll let this go a little longer. Let's see, Master Tide, I, I uh, salute you. Where, where can I, where did I? Um, like I say, I, I don't have the link. Let me see, I'll take a minute, see if I can quickly get the link from over here. Like I say, Paula Birch has a website that's just filled with tons of dye and information, but she also has sources of buying the dyes around the world. So this here is the only thing that I can really help you with. That's not what I wanted. Okay. So this here link is over to the Paula Birch website. And that might help you find these dyes. These are Procyon dyes. And you might be able to find them close to where you're at. But I personally don't know in Kolkata where you can buy them. But this might help you. Uh, let's see. Thank you, Annie. Uh, the Ripple Fold. Nope, I, I won't be doing the ripple fold because that's one that I learned from another artist, uh, Josh Shep. He does have a tutorial that he sells. And so I supported Josh and purchased his tutorial so that I could learn. So that's not a, a design that I will be showing, but there is one similar that, you know, I've played with it on and off over the years. And recently I've heard it called the wigwag. So that is a design that I do have in my video queue that I'll be doing at some point, but I haven't made that video yet either. So, okay. Uh, we got uh, Mustang Xena at 115 still. And let's see, how much was your most... Uh, I don't, I can't think off the top of my head uh, as far as which tapestry auction brought in the most, but there's been a few of them that I think came in at 120 or 140. So, but yeah, my work, depending on what it is, I mean, some of the more basic ones, they go for less. Some of the more detailed ones, they go for more. So, and I just, I enjoy putting them out there. This here has been a, a fun way. It, the auctions on YouTube just started by somebody saying that they don't get over onto Facebook, so they miss out on the auctions. So I decided to try it out on YouTube, and it's gone well. So, okay, we still have the high bid. It's Mustang Zinga 115. So I'm going to close it out in about one minute. So if anybody else wants to bid on it, let me know or place your bid. And then we're going to go into the question and answer section here. Oh, yeah, we still have over 100 people watching. That's awesome. Okay, so 115 going once to Mustang Xena. 115 going twice. 
I need to practice my my auction voice. <laughs> can I can I hear one twenty one twenty one twenty? <laughs> Sorry, no, we're not gonna do that. Okay, one fifteen going three times. And sold to Mustang Zena for one fifteen. Thank you, thank you. And I will post my launch links. Oh, nope, that's not the launch links. So that's where you can go in and pay, or I guess you could wait and pay me in person. It'll probably try to meet up someplace for you to pick up, right? Anyways, so we'll we'll just leave it there. Congrats to Mustang Zena. That's one of my friends there. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and open it up to questions and answers. And sometimes I get 10 questions at a time and I can't keep up with all of them. But I will try to answer as many questions as I can here. But I first need to check my phone to make sure having my speaker plugged in. I can't, oh, it doesn't show me how much battery life I have. Okay. I went ahead and I just plugged it in. I don't want to take a chance. I think last week when the whole thing froze, it was because my battery went dead. Or not dead, but it went weak. So, but unfortunately, the, the battery and the microphone both plug into the same port, so I can only have one of them at a time, but I figured once I was down to the Q&A portion, that I could lower this down a little bit and be closer to the mic here as I talk. And adjust that. Okay. So... Yes, congrats to Mustang Xena. Yes, yes, maybe we can have lunch or something. So we'll, after the video and stuff, we'll figure out when and where is good to meet up. But thank you, thank you. Yes, you got a, yourself an awesome tapestry. That was one that Julie's saying, no, I don't know, you might have to keep that one. <laughs> so at least we, we're keeping it here in Oregon. How about that, Julie? We're keeping the tapestry in Oregon. Okay, but I'll probably have to make one for us too. How important is it to wear a mask when mixing dyes? Uh, personally, I think it's very important. Uh, I know there's some people that they might not wear them, but I think the wearing a mask and especially the ones that have the little filters because the fine dust particles can get into your nose and down into your lungs and stuff, and that's just not a good thing. So. But at the bare, bare minimum, some sort of a mask to block that. These are the best, but it's, anything is better than nothing when you're mixing dyes. So that's my personal opinion. It's very important. Not a question, just a huge thank you for being you and doing what you do. Oh, thank you, tie-dye, and you're welcome. And thank you for supporting my channel. Yes, like I say, when I felt called a few years ago to be of service i didn't really know just what that meant you know I, I knew that i wanted to be of service to the world in some way and i just didn't know how but as i kind of meditated with it what came to me was doing uh sharing my knowledge i've been doing this art for 20 years and there's lots of people i mean I'm, i belong to all the facebook tie-dye pages and i just seen so many people asking questions i knew there was just a lot of help being needed and somebody suggested I do videos. And after the third person in a very short period of time suggested I make videos, even though I felt like I was a shy person and couldn't do it, I decided I was going to make some. And then, lo and behold, I started having fun with it. So, anyways, you're welcome. And that's why I do what I do. Because I have a lot of fun with this art. And I want to see everybody have success if they want to. And sometimes this art could be tricky to get into. 
Uh, all my stores in the area are out of Tulip. Where can I get cheap dye like that? Uh, that I don't know. I've never used the Tulip dyes. Um, I've always used just the Procyon dyes. And I know the dye houses are running low on that also. So it might be a matter of uh, checking out. I put, put that Paula Birch link up. I know it does have some links to smaller dye houses and that might be something that we're going to have to start tapping into um, as the dye shortages continue just because of all of the shutdowns and things. We're just not getting the, the shipments in like normal. Anyways, I'm a beginner. Is it best to wait till the shirt is completely dry after tying it up before applying the dye? Um, that's, there's two different things that I, I kind of decide if it's like a spiral or a scrunch, something that's just one or two layers of the shirt. Um, then I will go ahead and still dye it when it's damp. But if I've tied it up tightly, you know, like a Mandela, like the one that I tied up today, this tapestry with the many layers of fabric, those ones, I will go ahead and let them dry because then the wicking action, when you put the, the liquid dye on, it, it spreads into the drier sections. So when you have something with many layers of fabric and you put the dye on, it, it wicks down in there. So the dry fabric is going to help. If the fabric is wet in there, then that's going to almost create a barrier. The dye is going to go as far as the wetness is and then stop. So... It just depends on what you have tied up as to whether you, you dye it damp or you let it dry. Uh, but there are some people that they just let them, they, they will let everything that they do dry. Uh, the most important thing is sometimes when you put the dye on, when it's dry, it wants to roll off. So that's why I put soda ash in one of these spray bottles. And then that way you can just mist the fabric down and then add your dye and that helps it soak in. Uh, where did the name Mr. Tie-Dye come from? That came from a bunch of first and second graders in Pendleton, Oregon. So after I had closed my store, um, I had a store in Pendleton and then we moved it to La Grande and then we closed it there and I moved back to Pendleton on my way to someplace else. At the point, I didn't know where I was going or what I was doing, but I was still doing tie-dye because I just loved tie-dye so much. And one of the schools asked if I could come tie-dye with the kids. They were going to be taking a trip to the Pendleton Roundup, and they wanted to have all of the class kids separated out so they could tell who was all in the school, but then they could separate out by class. So each classroom had two colors. So they did a light orange and a dark orange, and a light pink and a dark pink, and a light blue and dark blue, so and so on. I picked out, I think there was seven or eight classes that I separated out and I just mixed, you know, full strength dye and then I, you know, watered it way down so that I would have two shades of the same color and I went in and I tie dyed with the whole class. Well, the first and second graders, they couldn't pronounce my last name, which is McClellan. So all day long, they kept hollering out, Mr. Tie Dye, can you come help me? Mr. Tie Dye, can you come help me? And lo and behold, I was in search of a business name at that point in time. I knew that I wanted to continue with the tie-dye. I had been doing the store, which was called Indigo Child, but I didn't want to continue on with that name because that was the store and this was going to be just me and doing just tie-dye. Indigo Child was uh, a bookstore and gift and candle and crystal store and tie-dye. So with just tie-dye, I wanted to have something more fitting. And at the time, I was doing a lot of socks, and the name Walking on Rainbows had come to me. But it still, that was just kind of too long, too of a mouthful. So by the time I was done tie-dyeing with the school, I knew Mr. Tie-Dye was the name. So I went, researched it. There was nobody that had the name, so I applied for it. And lo and behold, I became Mr. Tie-Dye. So it was, the name was given to me by first and second graders. So I really cherished the name Mr. Tie-Dye. Sorry for the very, very long answer. Julie can be happy to know it's close. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, what would, would you dye a duvet cover the same way as tapestry? Yes. 
Yeah, the duvet covers usually they're the two layers, right? The with the zipper, the pocket, or something to slide in. So yeah, I would just fold it up the same way that I would fold up the the, the tapestry. Of course, you're dealing with the double layer, so you just have to work with it. You can try either doing fewer folds or just make sure that you let it dry out completely before you go to dye it. And that way you will take advantage of the, the wicking action of the liquid. But yes, I would do it the same way. Uh, okay, I jumped too far. Uh, when you do a rainbow, which one is your favorite color combination? Um, probably my turquoise. Well, let, let's start at the, the beginning. I start with fuchsia, then deep orange, then lemon yellow, then emerald green, then turquoise. And I usually put two blues in there because of the, the chakras. So then I go with sapphire blue and plum for my purple. So those are my, my favorite for that, but I will sometimes mix it up. You know, I'll put in my bright green in place of this, or I'll put in my gold in place of the orange. I'll put red in in place of the fuchsia. Uh, or sometimes I'll use just all of the darker colors. But those, the, the light bright rainbow, I think is my favorite. Uh, thank you for your videos. I'm making 4th of July shirts. Awesome. Have fun with that. I do have a few 4th of July videos where I do a few different designs in the red, white, and blue. And then the, the one main thing that I will work with, I will put some plain water or thickened water into a squirt bottle. And then I use this here in the white areas just to hold space. Because once again, when you put liquid on a t-shirt, it wants to equalize in there. So that means that the, the liquid, the wet part, was will move towards the dry spot. So if you put red and blue on and leave the white dry, then they're both going to want to spread right into that space. So if you use the, the water, and I, I usually call it my white dye, but it's not dye, it's just water. Sometimes it's plain water, sometimes it's thick water, but I add that in those spaces, and that then helps hold that space. So have fun and happy 4th of July. I was hoping to get another video made up in red, white, and blue. And I just didn't get to it. And we're running out of time now. So I don't know if I'll have time to get another red, white, and blue video made up. I also had an idea come to me for a firework design. And I didn't get that made up. So anyways, when I do get them made up, you can make them up for next year. You can practice on them all year long. That's what I'm doing. Giving you plenty of time to practice. <laughs> um, what dyes do you personally use? I use fiber reactive dyes. Uh, the Procyon dyes. And most of mine come from Dharma. So these are the ones that I use. I do have some from Grateful Dyes. And I have some from Custom Colors. But they're all Procyon dyes. They're all the same type. They just have, I think each company has their own, you know, way of blending their, their dyes up in different ways. So, but most of my dyes are Dharma. That's because I started with Dharma 20 years ago. And they've always been fast and relatively inexpensive shipping since I live just in Oregon I get my if I place an order in normal times not during the shutdown times I could place an order on Monday morning and receive it Wednesday afternoon so that's why I go with Dharma and I, I just love their colors they have fantastic colors and all of the products I used to buy a whole bunch of the white clothes from them when I was doing the markets so those are my dyes that I use. Is Procyon the dye the best? Uh, as far as what I know it is, I haven't seen other than uh, Takafumi. Uh, he's a Japanese tie-dye artist, and he has a different type of liquid dye. I bought some of them, but I haven't gotten around to using them. But that was another type of dye, and he searched for many years to find them, and... I bought mine through him. I think he might still sell them through a website someplace, but I'm not positive on that. The only ones that I have been using is the Procyon dyes, 
And as far as other artists out there, oh, excuse me, Procyon dies is what I think most of the professional dyers use. So in my opinion, yes, Procyon dies are the best. Uh, it's, I got my Procyon die from the Plaza Art. Awesome. How can I keep the red dye from bleeding yellow on the edges? Uh, the Some of the different red dyes do that. I switched around until I found one that didn't do it or did it very minimally, which is Fire Red from Dharma. But one of the ways that you can do it is when you put your, your red dye down. So I'm just going to do just a quick demo here. When you put your red dye down, if you then pretty quickly put a little bit of uh, water right next to that edge, you're creating a barrier. It's not as likely... Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I didn't check to make sure I was... Oh, no. Okay, that's better. Okay, so you could put a strip of red down and then immediately put a strip of your clear, your water right next to it and let it kind of spread over to the red pretty immediately. And that will help kind of create a little bit of a wall right here with the, the liquid. Because really what the liquid is trying to do is spread into drier areas. So by Sealing that edge up, then it's not likely to bleed, but you have to put your red down and then your water down pretty quick, quickly. You might have a little bit of spreading and mixing, and you might get like a pink edge, but I think I would rather have a slight pink edge than a yellow edge. So anyway, I hope that that helps you, but yeah, that color bleeding can be a pain. Now sometimes it's really nice. Um, sometimes I'll mix my own purple up from fuchsia and turquoise because then when I put that on, then the edges bleed the turquoise, and I just like that look. But I know what you mean. If you're trying to do red, white, and blue, you don't want yellow in there. So try that, that water thing, and if plain water doesn't work, then you might need to go in and make thickened water. But plain water should work for that to, to just hold that space, because really what you're trying to stop is dye spreading. And if it, all the fabric is wet, then it's not gonna spread. See, I'm so happy to be a rainbow warrior. Awesome. I'm glad you're a rainbow warrior too, Michelle. And of course, everybody is a rainbow warrior out there. If you love color in any way, whether you do tie-dye or you just wear tie-dye or you just love to play with color in some fashion, you're a rainbow warrior. And I'm getting close to having the design. I just got some of the tea samples in with the design on them. Uh, so. Once I kind of try those out, I'm going to do an announcement and just kind of put them out there for, I'm going to do some drawings and giveaways and then you guys can order some of your own Rainbow Warrior teas for me if you like. Oven or microwave dry carefully. Um, if, if I was going to put mine in the microwave, I would not, uh, I would start with a, a damp tea to start with, put my colors on, and then microwave it. If you start with a dry tea in the microwave and you have dyed it, but maybe there's a little spot that didn't get dye put on it, then you have a dry spot. And in the microwave then, that can start smoking. You can end up burning a hole in your shirt. Um, I have done a little bit of microwave dyeing. That just speeds up the process. Every now and then I'll get somebody that They'll contact me and they say, I know this is last minute, but can you get me a tea made tomorrow? And the microwave definitely helps with that. So I, I, but I make sure that I'm starting with a damp tea because you don't want to take any kind of a chance that you have a dryness in there if you're using the microwave. Now the oven is one that I haven't tried that method, but I have heard of people that they'll put their t-shirt on like a baking tray of some sort, put it in the, the oven and heat it I'm not sure how hot for an hour, flip it over, heat it, and then they are able to let it cool and wash it. I personally haven't done that, so I can't really give any advice on that aspect. 
Um, let's see. Looks like I'm way behind on my questions. I'll try to catch up here. Uh, I love the story how you got your name. It makes me smile every time I hear it. Awesome. Yeah, like I said, it was a, a special thing to go to school to teach the kids and then to walk away with the name. I'm making 4th of July shirts for my family also. Awesome. I hope you guys have fun. The, one of the things that I learned is to leave a little bit bigger of a white spot than what you think. If you like a lot, if you like the red, white, and blue to kind of be evenly through there. Sometimes when you try to leave it just a little narrow space and the dye spreads a little bit, then it gets even smaller. And then you have a red and blue shirt with just a little bit of white. So I, if I'm doing red, white, and blue, I try to do a lot of white. And even some of the ones I've done, I've added a little bit too much dye on them. But they sure are fun. So have fun with that. I wish you success. Sir, after coloring the cloth, how much time it takes to dry? Okay, whenever I'm done dyeing it, I put it into a tub that has a rack in here to start with. The rack is going to keep it up off the bottom just in case any of the extra colors bleed through. I don't want it sitting in a puddle. So I like to have mine on a rack and then I will put a lid on this and it's going to batch. I want to keep it wet. You don't want your, your key or your tapestry to dry out because then the dyeing pro or the dye bonding process stops. So I will put a lid on this and then I'll put it out in the sun so that it can heat up, but it's not to dry it out. It's just to help the, the, the dye bonding process. And I leave mine for a minimum of 24 hours, but I prefer 48 hours for mine. But 24 hours will give you good results. And I know some people that they live in the hotter areas, they will batch for less time because the heat does speed things up. Me personally, I still leave mine for 48 hours, regardless of whether I've had heat on it or not. That's my own personal preference. Uh, how do you make thick water? Um, I do have a couple of videos. Let me see if I can quickly call that up. So here is the video for for the first process of making thick dye water. That's with a product from Dharma. And uh, I also put urea and salt in it. It makes it for the, the perfect blend for doing uh, dye painting, which that's who I learned it from was Ed Kapek, who does a lot of dye painting. The urea helps keep the t-shirt the damp while it batches. And since most of the time when you're painting, the t-shirt is out flat, you don't have a lot of liquid there. So anything you can do to help keep that damp is going to help. So, but you can leave the, the salt and the urea out if you want to. Um, I just prefer to put those in. And so that's how I make the, the thick water. Um, and you can then use the thick water just in a bottle like this here, or you can add dye to it to make thick dye then. And that's what I use. I make thick black dye for doing outlining. So I basically, I take that thick water that I made, I add dye powder to it, and I blend it up. Yep, sodium alginate. Thank you, Saucy Mayor. Um, how about a vegetable steamer like you used for the decolorant? Uh, yes, you could use one of those for heating also. I'm not sure. Um, you might get a little bit more bleeding with that, but that might also create some extra texture. I haven't actually tried that yet. I might have to do that just as a, an experiment and see how that does, but anything of uh, the heating up, the steaming, I have used a, a steam wand like those clothing steamers that have a wand with a bunch of holes in it. You basically put, take the wrinkles out of your clothes while I've dyed something and then just kind of push that right onto my, my dyed t-shirt and just forced steam through it. And then I was able to let those cool and then wash them pretty quickly after that. So that did work too. So the vegetable steamer I think would work in that same process. It would heat it up which helps set the, the dyes set faster. Uh, 
Oh, Christy, yep, you're just, you came right in at the question answer time. Yeah, when I changed the format, it did the kind of shorten things. But that means, though, that when you go back to rewatch it, you'll be able to watch the whole tying and dying of the tapestry. Uh, I did answer just a couple questions, but pretty much that was all I did was just tie that up, and that took one hour. And then we did the auction. That took, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 minutes. And now we're into Q&A, and I'm going to probably close this up here soon, too. But I want to try and get through all of these questions before I do. Uh, how long have you been doing doing this and do you enjoy it? I've been doing this for 20 years and yes, I do enjoy it very much. I love that I can make a living doing tie-dye. I mean, I've done, done it in lots of different ways from doing uh, the different festivals, uh, Saturday markets, uh, craft shows. I've done tie-dye home parties. I've done tie-dye school events. Um, I also was involved with an organization. They did leadership training for teenage youths on reservations. So I took five different business trips as Mr. Tie-Dye where I went and did a uh, video, not video presentation, the, the slideshow presentation, PowerPoint, that's it. I did a PowerPoint presentation where I used tie-dye as my metaphor for life. So I had all these pictures and stuff about uh, making choices. And when you start out with tie-dye, you know, you had, I told them you had three choices. So I took my three colors. But see, then from those choices, if you blend these two, then you get a different color. You blend those two and you get, so it just expanded on the choices. So anyways, I went to South Dakota, um, Montana. I did one here in Oregon and one down in Utah. Maybe I went to four places. That's all I can think of anyways. So, yes, I've done lots of different things as Mr. Tie-Dye, and now I do mostly online sales. And then, of course, I do these videos, which I do the videos for free, but then I put uh, the commercials on before and after my videos. I don't like videos that have the ads in the middle, so I don't put them in mine either. So... Anyway, so you can watch from the beginning to the end without a commercial. You might have a little pop-up thing that you can close. But Anyway, so those are different ways that I've made money at tie-dye. And being able to do tie-dye for a living, yes, I enjoy that. I set my own schedule. There's some times where I'm just busy, busy working. And then there's other times where I decide I need a few days off. So like this past weekend, we had solstice weekend. So I took from Friday through Monday basically off. You know, I did a little bit of work. I answered some questions, but I just took all that time off. Uh, hiding. <laughs> you leave my cuticle pusher alone. You see, I even checked to make sure it was still there. Uh, my brother is a fanboy of you and your work. Awesome. I, I love having fans out there. Although I am going to stay humble, saucy. Uh, yay, I last he did dry out some, repeated with soda ash, but don't know if it helped in any way. Yeah, if it dries out, that stops the, the dye bonding process. So adding the soda ash to it will turn that back on. Now, whether it actually helped or not, or if it had bonded enough, I don't know. But yes, re-wetting something, if, it, if it's gone completely dry, is going to help turn that back on, and you can just batch it for longer. Instead of oven or a microwave, can you use a steamer to quicken the batching time? Yes. Like I say, it's been a while since I played with the, the steamer, and I haven't done one actually in the rice steamer yet. I've just done the decolorant. But if you're able to heat that up, uh, I'm not sure what temperature you need to get it up to, but when I do the microwave, I put them in there for two minutes, and I either put mine in a gallon-sized Ziploc baggie, and when the steam fills up, I'll turn the microwave off, and when it goes back down, I turn it back on. It usually takes about two and a half, or three to three and a half minutes to run the two and a half minutes of time, and then I let that cool, and once it's cooled, then I go ahead and wash it. So I'm sure with the steaming, you should be able to do, this, do the same thing. Steam it to get the whole thing up nice and hot, and although steaming would probably be longer than just two minutes, you would, I would probably steam it for at least an hour and then turn it off, let it cool, and then I could probably go into 
washing it. And I might go ahead and do a, a test on that and do a video just to show people that method. So, okay, let me see. Does urea make the fabric smell? Um, if, if your urea has gone bad, I know sometimes when I make up this thick water, uh, if it sits for too long, which this one here has, it does have a bit of a smell to it. it smells almost kind of like an ammonia smell. So I would imagine if you used uh, thick water that has a smell to it, then it would make the fabric smell, but I would imagine that that should wash back out. But I haven't had noticed any difference in my fabrics that have had the urea used on them. Went out by mistake, watch the long ad, what did I miss? Oh, <laughs> thank you for watching the ad. I don't know what you missed, but we've already done the, the auction and we're just doing Q&A right now. The tutorial was the first hour of the, the video. So when I end this, you should be able to go back in and watch the tutorial all by itself if you want. Uh, let's see, use a timer for your auction time. It will help up, yeah, that, that does. I, sh I, I will make a note of that. I think that's a good idea just to click through the auction. I can set a time. So I'm going to make myself a note. So let's see who said that. Robbie. Thank you, Robbie, for that suggestion. That I think that'll work perfect and really kind of help streamline then the auction. I can even set it up so you guys can see the timer and know that when we go down and then I'll do the close out at the end. Okay. Question, what happens if you die and immediately untie it? Will it batch okay that way or does it ruin it? Oh, you mean like if you twisted up a rainbow spiral tee, dyed it, and then opened it up flat? Is that what you are meaning? Um, it's possible that you might get some dye contamination just as you're opening it up. But then when you go to batch it, you have a thinner fabric now. When you have it all wrapped up, the fabric is tight and condensed, and that's going to help keep it wet. But if you open it up, then it might dry out faster. And it would be harder to re-wet it with it open because if you sprayed it with soda ash, then some of the dye might start spreading. So it's something you can do. You can try it out and see. Uh, it's not something that I think is going to work very well because of the batching time. You still need to batch it. Uh, if you don't batch it at all, then when you wash it, most of the dye is going to come back out and you're going to end up with kind of a pastel -y look to it. I stopped using Tulip one step recently and it changed my life. Awesome. Yes, that's that's one of the best things that I can recommend to somebody using Tulip is to switch to Procyon if you're wanting better colors. Got to go. Good luck with your work. And my brother wants to meet you one day and show you his tie-dye. Awesome. Thanks for stopping in, Hunter. And yes, I do hope to one day be able to travel the country and meet people. Uh, so yes, thank you. Tell your brother I said hello. Peace and have a great day. Okay, let's see what else we got here. Doing tie dye painting, so urea might need to happen. Yeah, the urea is just is going to help keep things wet. Uh, I anytime I do dye painting, I use urea in my dye. Oh man, I've got to go to the backyard to watch the whole video. Egg timer. Oh, yeah, egg timer would work, too. But I have uh, a timer that I can... Well, no, I guess I use my phone for my timer. Yeah, I can I can find something, but I wanted to have something that people could actually see the time when I set it up here. So, and yeah, maybe the egg timer will work, too. I just don't happen to have an egg timer. We'll figure out something before next week, and we'll give that a try. Where's the best place to get large blank tapestry? I buy mine from Sunshine Joy. Uh, but they're, the largest one they have in stock right now is 58 by 90. If you're wanting bigger than that, you might need to either uh, contact 
the uh, Bo Dorsey. He makes custom taps and let him know what size you need, and he can give you a quote. Or the other thing you can do is just buy the fabric. I know I, I bought the fabric from Dharma. I believe the code on it is MUS10, M-U-S-10. And that's uh, a nice thick weight muslin that's 10 feet wide. I think it shrinks down a few inches, but then you can make a, a big one. I made a tapestry recently for Louise, who is, I'm not sure if she's still here today, but she was here. And I made it 10 feet by 12 and a half feet. That was the big uh, space tapestry that I did. So that's if you need the big ones. Or the other thing I've done for big tapestries is I'll buy flat sheets from Target online. And I think it's the Threshold brand. I buy the 300 thread count. It a, makes a decent price for the, the blanks. And those, like I say, you can buy full size, queen size, king size, depending on how big you need to make it. Let's see. When urea decays, it produces ammonia. That's, yeah. Yeah, so as the urea gets older in your thickened water, it does put off that ammonia smell. And that's the point where I'll dump it out. I used to be able to go through a whole jug of the, the thick dye in that time. I would make up a half gallon of the really thick stuff. And my other dyes, I thick in just the, the tiniest bit. But I made up six gallons of dye water at a time. But my dyeing has slowed way down, so I'm not using it up, so it just keeps going bad. So I usually make smaller batches now. Uh, Comic Cons, Mr. Tie Dye, if, if they ever happen again. Oh, <laughs> me show up at a Comic Con? Yes, I, I did show up. Uh, had somebody invite me to a mascot thing that they were doing up in Portland so I just put on all my tie-dye and I went up as Mr. Tie-dye because I was my own mascot. I struggled with pastels. The products are so good and they still come out bright even if you wash it out really quick. Yeah the, the best way to do uh, pastels I still haven't gotten around to making a video yet but it would be a matter of starting out I would probably add just you know, like this much dye in the bottom and fill up the bottle the rest of the way with plain water for my pastel dye. But I don't, I don't have exact measurements. That's just kind of where I would start. Or if you're mixing with powders, I would start with um, like a quarter, uh, maybe an eighth to a quarter of a teaspoon of dye for eight ounces of dye. Just as a kind of a general starting place for pastels. But one of these days, I'm going to try to get the... Uh, sit down and do the testing and figure out the official measurements and put out a video. I just haven't done it yet. Life gets busy. What? Yeah, but that, that gives a different look. I mean, it looks faded, but it's not really pastel. Yeah, Julie was saying a 50-50 blend tea, but really that, that's not the same thing as a pastel because your fibers are just interwoven and only part of them are taking the fiber or the dye. So it gives more of a, a faded look than a pastel look. The best pastel look is going to come from mixing your dyes and then doing the full batch time so that you're getting all of the color in there. When you do the full strength dye and you put your dyes on and then wash it immediately, uh, the colors aren't going to be quite as true as they will mixing the dyes. Just a really uh, weak blend of dye is going to be the best way. Anyways, giant stopwatch. Yes, we will figure that out. I appreciate the suggestions. If you go with the timer, you'll still have to do the auctioneer voice for the going, going, going. Yes. Yeah, I would, once it goes off, then I would do the official closeout. But the timer would at least keep people engaged. If I set it for like, you know, maybe 10 minutes, then people knew that if they want their bidding in, they need to get it in in that 10 minutes or right at the close. Although that might cause some, some last minute bids. We can try it and see. And then we can adjust it if we need to. You can get mainstay flat sheets 
uh, in white from Walmart as well. I think they are around 200 thread counts. Okay, so there's another option for uh, buying locally is mainstay flat sheets. Somebody suggested. He's even more special in person. Oh, thank you, Larry. Yeah, it's Larry. He lives not too far from me, and he's bought some tie-dye from me. So he usually comes up and picks it up. Uh, less time to begin with, more work. Oh, okay, you're right. Thank you for helping answer those questions. Um... Tie dye stall at Comic Con with the likes of Deadpool, Jack Skelly, and Spider Man would be great. Oh, I see, yes. <laughs> I'm having trouble with the back staining. What's the best best way to rinse before putting in the washing machine? Okay, before we get to the rinsing part, uh, if you're having trouble with back staining, one of the things that you can try doing is batching for a longer period of time. Um, after 24 hours, when you do the rinse out, some of that dye is still active. And if it's active, it can go back in and bond with your, your cotton fibers. At 48 hours, with some heat, most of the dye at that point is spent. And then I start out my rinse in the sink. I leave it tied up, and I rinse in cold water for about a minute. And I kind of give it a good squeeze to get the... the the water into the middle of that but basically what I'm trying to do is rinse away the soda ash because the soda ash is what raises the pH level which is what activates your dyes so at the, at the rinse out time you don't want any more of your dyes being activated so rinse in cold water to start with and then I have my washing machine filled up with hot water with synthropol in it the synthropol is a pH neutral soap and it helps keep the dye particles suspended in the water so that they can't go back in and backstain. And I know some dyers, they use Blue Dawn dish soap. It too is a pH neutral soap. But those are going to be the best things. Batch for longer, rinse in cold water before you open it up, and then to make sure you use, and you want to go right from your rinsing right into the washing machine. If you set two or three shirts aside in a pile or in a bucket while you're rinsing more stuff they're in the process of back staining right there so i rinse one you know i might have three or four things in the sink that i'm rinsing all at the same time but i'll work with one and once i rinse it i kind of squeeze out the excess and i go back and immediately put it right into the washing machine that has hot water and synthropol and that way you're cutting down any of your chances for back staining and for my synthopol, and I imagine the same thing with Blue Dawn, you want just a little bit of suds on the water. You don't want like a big bubble bath. So at the first wash, I will add a whole bunch, and that does prevent, provide a lot of soap. But by the time it mixes in, then that thins out some. And if I go back and I check on my water and there's no suds at all, I'll go ahead and add just a little bit more synthopol, turn on the water to, to create a few suds. That lets me know that the synthopol is in there and working. So I hope that helps you with your, your back staining problem, um, Fernando. Uh, do you ever dyed any other color shirts? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, most of the time I do start with a white shirt, but I have dyed blue shirts. You know, they're a light color. You can add darker colors on. If they're too dark, then really you can only add, you know, black or something else darker than it. But I've dyed light blue, light gray, light tan, light yellow, light purple, light pink. So I've started with all kind of range because a lot of those were ones that people brought to me. They said, you know, this is a cotton shirt. Can you dye it? As long as it's light color, you can add darker colors on top. Now, granted, if you're starting with a light blue and you put yellow on on the light blue, it's not going to go to like a, a bright green, but it is going to have a greenish tinge to it. So it, it will alter the, the color a little bit. But if you're going with starting with a, a gray or a light tan, uh, those pretty much I haven't really noticed too much of uh, color changing when you're dyeing them. Science with math, math Mr. Tie-Dye, yes. 
there is a little bit of science in, involved and a little bit of math. Have you ever had a problem with mold happening during batching? Nope, I haven't ever batched uh, long enough to have mold happen. Uh, every now and then I've had uh, teas stored in my tub down here that have been soaked in soda ash. And I usually try to get to those you know, within a couple weeks, but sometimes I will get busy and they'll sit in there for a month. And then that's when I notice that maybe a little bit of mold has happened and I'll tend to go ahead and wash them in hot water and bleach and stuff to take care of that. And then I re-soak them again. But as far as batching, nope, I have never had mold happen during batching. How long can I keep my dyes after it is mixed or do I need to throw it out? If you're using the fiber reactive Procyon dyes, uh, and you're mixing in with just the the water then I have mine around for two to three weeks and what I do is I'll write the date that I mix them right on the bottle so that way I know at what point uh, how old my dyes are at any point in time if I get up to that three week mark on my my dyes and I still have a half a bottle I'll go ahead and add another scoop of powder and blend it up again and I only do that just one time you can't blend it over and over again because you're gonna end up with a bunch of sediment down the bottom but if you have a fridge to store in then the dye is gonna last even longer but if you're working with one of the one-step kits that you buy in the store that don't require soda ash then usually the, the activating ingredient, whether it's soda ash or whatever, is mixed in with your dye powder. And as soon as you add water to it, then the dyes become active. Those ones, I recommend if you're using a one-step kit, that you get everything all tied up and ready to go first. And then mix your dyes and then use them immediately. And try to use them all up because they're not going to be good the next day if it's called a one-step kit. So I hope that answers your question. I tried a uh, tie-dye shirt today. It was red, white, and striped at the bottom and blue with white spots on the top. Awesome. Also did the... Okay, yeah, uh, Saucy said that tulip dyes is maybe two days in her opinion of using the dyes. Yeah, I've heard different people say different things. I personally have never used the tulip dyes, so I can't say anything for sure on those. I just know that these ones here, as long as you don't mix soda ash in with them, they last for two to three weeks without the color deteriorating. And some of them will deteriorate faster, like my emerald green at two week parts, I will go ahead and add more dye into the emerald because it seems like the it dies off faster. But yeah, you can just kind of test it out and see, like say, if you write dates on the bottles, then you know how long they've been around. Okay, well, I think I'm gonna close this out. We're coming up right on two hours here. And that was kind of my timeline of where I was trying to shoot for is a two hour video. So thank you guys for joining me here. Looks like we still have over 100 people watching, so that's awesome. I think last week it dropped back off down to about 70. So to have over 100 people watching at the end is awesome. I appreciate you guys. Let's see. Okay, yeah. So you guys have a great week. I will be doing my little reveal video. Like I say, most times I do it on... You know, I, I do my washout on Friday morning so I can have the video up in the morning. Uh, and if that works out, that's what I'll do. And you guys have a great weekend and have fun making whatever tie-dye projects you're working on. And as always, I wish you guys success in all that you do. Spread some love and light out into the world because right now we need the world needs that. So just make some phone calls. Talk to your neighbors, put some signs up in your window, anything you can do to spread some love. Try to have a little bit of patience and compassion for the people that are out there doing these different jobs at the places that are starting to open back up again. And I think that's all I have to say. Peace, love, light, and laughter to all, and namaste. I will see you guys again next week. Love you, Mom. <laughs>